all these projects, all these programs, all these hundreds of individuals, CIA operators, paramilitary operators, engineers, spies, servicemen, all of them, at almost all of them at some point in the reporting history, tell me, Annie, I did what I did so we would prevent nuclear World War III. And that's why this new book I wrote, Nuclear War, A Scenario, is so significant for me in like a timeline of my work as an author because there's this, like once I knew I was going to write that book, it was like the most obvious moment of all. It was like, but of course, all of these other books have led up to this narrative, which frightens the hell out of me, yeah. even reading it, you know, for the hundredth time, right? I mean, how, what was your experience reading? I it? was terrified. I was terrified reading it. I had to. I had to put it down and and go for multiple walks during the process of reading that book. And I, like I told you, I was listening to uh, Christopher Nolan's movie soundtrack while I was reading the book, and it was like watching a movie in real life. I mean, you talk about nukes in in all of your books, mm -hmm. and the what I love about the new book is it's. A, it's it's a fictional scenario, but it's also a real scenario. And it's, I have so many questions because it's like, it's not like you just go from place to place talking about events that happened. You're talking about a potential event that could happen. You're, you're playing it out, a, a fictional, a, a scenario that could possibly happen, which makes that book so unique and so captivating to read. And it's- And a, and a small correction is that I don't know, I wouldn't call the book fictional. I would call it right. a fact-based yes. scenario, yes. right? Because everything that is reported in the book, I take you through what will happen from nuclear launch to nuclear winter. Yes. And the shocking part, as you now know having read it, is that this happens in seconds and minutes yes. and hours, yes. not months and years. I mean, Nuclear Winter itself, the, the part five of the book, is a longer part. But the war itself is, a se is 74 minutes, right? Because 72 is... Because what I learned from the different sources that I worked with, and, and let me just say, you know, two Secretary of Defenses... Uh, the head, a former Stratcom commander, former nuclear subforce commander, uh, the former director of FEMA, the person in charge of what to do with the public after nuclear war, which you learn is not much because, as he told me, everyone will be dead. Right. So, I take the reader, and this was the shocking part because when I approached it, one wondered, how will I do this? Right. How does one keep it on point of, of fact and not go into, you know, making things up? And the, and the only things that are made up in the book are in italics, and that's the dialogue that, like, for example, the Secret Service right. director or the, the special agent in charge of the president's detail for the Secret Service will say to the cat team element because – and that also comes from my interviews with those individuals when I would say, well, like, what would you say? And in some places, I'm able to quote a secretary of defense because he says, no, Annie, this is what I would say this and will give me a verbatim line. That's when you see it's in quotes. Right. But otherwise, he says, well, this would be total chaos and, you know – this is called jamming the president when the stratcom commander is saying this and the sec def is saying this and the joint chiefs of staff is saying that right right the chairman that's what i love about it because it's not told in like a third person it's told as in like first person you're there it's mm -hmm. happening now that's what makes yes. like that's what really makes the book so gripping like it just it had me by the throat the whole time i was reading it was hard to put it down and also reporting that finding out these individual places that exist where thousands of people are rehearsing new, what what to do in nuclear war day in, day out, and have been doing this since 1945. This is the shocking part of it, you know, learning about the aerospace data facility in Colorado that, by the way, was classified. Its, its existence was classified until 2008. 
that that's where the data comes in from the satellite that sees the hot rocket exhaust on the ICBM as it launches in less than a second. So in a fraction of a second from the time that there would be a rogue launch, in my book I use the North Korean scenario, right? Mm -hmm. A fraction of a second, the entire command and control, nuclear command and control system knows, holy shit, nuclear launch, right? And then it's just tick, 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 counting down what happens. And that should scare the hell out of everyone because you don't really think of that anymore. No, you don't. We think, oh my God, the Cold War is over. Mm-hmm. People aren't, re- you know, and then, and yet you, in Ukraine, you have situations where you have, you know, the president of Russia talking about or alluding to maybe using a tactical nuke. These are terror. You have, you know, situations where people actually even contemplate this hopefully when they read the book they realize this is sheer madness the idea of even using one nuclear weapon Mm. all the war game scenarios in the pentagon have showed us that once one is launched it's the end game yes that was (laughs) that was like probably the scariest revelation for me because I, I, you know, I don't think anybody knows that. No, I don't think anybody is a, by and large, are is aware that we have a a rule that as soon as r- missiles launch heading towards us, we have to empty our arsenal. It's use it or lose it. At least for our ICBMs. Use them or lose them. I mean, and you then, can't even believe that you, when you hear that. Mm-hmm. But yet, that is an actual nomenclature that is tossed around. Washington. Mm -hmm. Same as how about the bolt out of the blue attack? Right. Right. When you learn these different strategies, launch on warning. I mean, for all the reporting I had done previously, six books prior to, you know, you hear sort of in passing, launch, you know, launch on warning, but you don't really know what that means until you drill down on it. And then you realize that we don't actually, that the way in which the policy is set up, and again, this is explained to me point by point from sec- former Secretary of Defense William Perry, right? Point by point, we do not wait to absorb a nuclear weapon. So right. once the satellite systems tell us, whoop, a nuke is on the way, launch on warning is the policy. Yeah. And, and then they, you, 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 I didn't know this, but they launched them over the, the North Pole to go hit – if it is from North Korea, it has to go over the fly over Russia to hit North Korea. And what are the chances that we can get Putin on the line in less than six minutes to tell them, hey, we got Merv nukes coming over your continent of Siberia and Russia that are going to go for North Korea. They're not coming for you. They're going for North Korea. That is terrifying. I mean, it's so terrifying and it really is almost unbelievable. Like, okay. I mean, most people do not realize that. And, even if you – when I had an initially – there's a, a brilliant scientist called Hans Christensen who keeps track of all of the nuclear weapons and reports them with his colleagues in the Bulletin of Atomic Science. Mm-hmm. You know, it's called the Nuclear Notebook. And so he keeps track of all these things. And I did the interview with Christensen and he's the one who said to me, absolutely, the nukes go over the North Pole if we're going to strike back at – North Korea, let's say, if they had, you know, attacked us. Right. And they have to overfly Russia, right? And so you think to yourself, wait, is that really plausible? And when I did my interview with former Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta, who was also a former director of the CIA mm-hmm. and was also a former White House chief of staff, okay? So he has been around in all these different positions. And he said to me, I'm paraphrasing, yes, the hole over the North Pole is a problem. You know, you just go, oh, my God, right? Like, how can this kind of existential, like, mayhem, potential apocalyptic mayhem exist Every second of every day 
of every year. And it does. And we just are kind of living with this sword of Damascus hold, hold, you know, over our heads. Yeah, yeah. Like, okay, well, and I really, I mean, the book is terrifying, but I hope that it brings to the table a discussion about all of this. Yeah. Like, you know, it's not something that is wise. And it's certainly not something, you know, when you look at the former president, you know, the whole fire and fury with, with North Korea, it's like, that just seems so reckless once you know how fundamentally perilous all of this is. Yeah, you said it great in the Pentagon's Brain book. You said every man, woman, and child has the sword of Damocles dang mm -hmm. dangling over their head by the thinnest of string strings. Yeah. And it could be cut at any moment by accident or by a miscommunication. Can you explain what's going on on the cover of your new book, Nuclear War? That is the Ivy Mike thermonuclear bomb, right? So atomic bombs, people think Hiroshima, Nagasaki, mm -hmm. those were tiny. A thermonuclear bomb is a two-stage weapon. It uses, it is an atomic bomb inside a nuclear bomb. The atomic bomb is the fuse. It's so incredibly powerful. That bomb is essentially the same. It's like if you set off 1,000 Hiroshima's at the same time A in the thousand. same place. 1,000. Wasn't it supposed to be smaller than it actually was? Well, the Ivy Mike bomb was the proof of was the test okay. that was the first thermonuclear test this is the one that was designed by richard garwin whom i interview for the book right and then and the idea at the time was how do we make these massive nuclear bombs smaller so we can fit them in the top of a ballistic missile to strike an enemy across the world right so the weight of the bomb had to actually be smaller if you go back in time to hiroshima it was in an aircraft. It got, like, dropped out of the aircraft. Yeah, it, it weighed 9,000 pounds. That's the size of a small elephant, okay? <sighs> and then they needed to, and then you had to create bombs with far more capacity to destroy. The megaton, Hiroshima was 15 kilotons. This weapon on the cover of my book is 10.4 megatons. It's so massive. And this is something like four and a half miles of fireball, right? So in, in the scenario that I tell in nuclear war, the first bomb that strikes is a, is a – the bomb that strikes Washington, D.C. is a one megaton thermonuclear weapon. And I describe the effects – factually based on all the details that all the scientists were measuring while we were exploding bombs like this. Because we wanted, we, meaning the Defense Department, the Atomic Energy Commission, wanted to know the effects that these bombs would have on people so they could plan war, mm -hmm. plan nuclear war. And this fireball was, you know, five, four and a half miles while the fireball and the one, a um, one megaton fireball is about 1.1 1 .1 miles wide. So just of pure fire, pure fire. Hurricane of fire. Everything in that fireball is incinerated. Nothing survives. Nothing. No insects, no cellular life, nothing. The distance from the Pentagon to the White House is two miles. What happens in the, in the second mile radius? Oh, my goodness. Well, I describe that thanks to the scientists that were measuring all of the nuclear weapons which are, were exploded from the end of the war until 1962 when the treaty prohibited uh, atmospheric testing. All of those mm -hmm. weapons tests that you, just, you, know, that you described earlier, um, they were – Perform to under for scientists, American scientists and engineers to understand how these effects would affect you know people, places, and things essentially, and they're all compiled in these books, and you can see in my source material that's where I pull all the information from. So, for example, like I can tell you precisely based on these documents, um, 
at what temperature, you know, the upholstery in a car, a 1958-style Buick, catches on fire and at what distance, right? Or at what distance pine needles catch on fire? Because this is the minutia that the government was recording and understanding because the idea was that one day we would have a nuclear war, which is just so mind-boggling when you read the scenario and you realize what a nuclear war will look like. It's a reading it. It's <clears throat> it's almost like the idea of having a plan in place for a nuclear war is irrelevant once it happens. It seems like there's no hope for anything after a nuclear bomb hits. I mean, you describe that the streets turn to molt, like they turn into molten rock. Yes. And that's from the effects book, by the way. I mean, that's just not my imagination. Right. You know, the, the level of details that you put in there of exactly like what happens to the roads, the cars, the, the human beings, the rivers, the lakes, like it's astonishing the amount of detail that you, that's, that they are aware of. And then you begin and you and it and it builds out from there and you realize, oh my God, nuclear command and control is a massive system of systems. There are there's the nuclear triad, which is America's nuclear arsenal. It's made up of the ICBMs and the silos that we spoke of. Mm -hmm. It's we have fourteen nuclear armed, nuclear powered Ohio class submarines right. that they call the handmaidens of the apocalypse because they are completely undetectable under the ocean and they are they can fire between 80 and 90 nuclear missile warheads in 90 seconds and I you did a great job of explaining the merved missiles yeah. how do those work so there's there's a there's there's like 20 something missiles on each sub and each of those missiles have like three warheads in each one that can hit multiple targets that are yes. predetermined. MERV stands for multiple independently targetable you know vehicles, mm -hmm. right? And so it's this idea that in the nose cone of one missile on a sub, right? Mm -hmm. And I misspoke. There's you know the numbers are dizzying. I write this in the book, right? On because in the subs, there is a missile that is called a trident, and inside the war inside the nose cone of the trident sits a merved missile, right? Which means there are mul these multiple warheads. So you can fire one trident out of a sub. It, you know, comes out of the vessel, breaches the surface of the ocean moves into boost phase and then goes ballistic through its mid-course phase, at which point the warhead releases the multiple warheads and they can independently target places that are up to, you know, several hundred miles away. And this system, the handmaiden of the apocalypse, can sneak up to a coast and essentially be 14 minutes away from a coast. And so this idea that we have the nuclear triad is so bizarrely redundant, right? We have the ICBMs in the ground. We have the, the, the missiles and the subs. And then we also have our bomber force, right? right? And so this is all set up to fundamentally lock down this idea that this is called deterrence, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, we have so many nuclear-armed weapon systems in our triad that if you dare try and attack us, we will annihilate you to your smoldering, you know, fireplace, right? And then the other side, the enemy, which used to just be Russia, you know, the superpower— but now there are nine nuclear armed states. The idea is like, okay, then they have their nuclear arsenal that is on par with ours, at least Russia is. And so they're saying essentially, you know, 
don't you dare attack us because we have the same amount of firepower, and if you do, we will turn you into a fireplace. And that is the fundamental premise of deterrence. And so the whole idea of nuclear war is predicated, of like not having a nuclear war is predicated on this idea of deterrence, which, as I write in the book, is just a theoretical phenomenon. It's like saying, okay, so if that works, great, we won't have a nuclear war. But what if it doesn't work? What if one rogue missile gets launched? And mm. that is the terrifying scenario that everyone in the national security system will really tell you, well, deterrence will hold. Because if it doesn't, this is what's going to happen. Well, because we have super sophisticated defense rockets, right? NORAD that can shoot down missiles out of the sky. Which is pure fantasy. Pure fantasy. Pure fantasy. Because as we discussed earlier, the U.S. arsenal is about 1,700 ready for launch, more or less, okay? And Russia has the same. China has 500 now. North Korea has maybe 50, okay? Um, and so people think, well, we have, you know, they imagine like Israel's Iron Dome. Well, our system is called the Interceptor System, and it's run by the Missile Defense Agency. And they have a grand total of 44 interceptor missiles. And the success rate of those interceptor missiles is between 40 and 55 percent. So if and you don't start a nuclear war with a couple missiles, you send the mother load. So if you send 1,700 missiles or even 1,000 missiles at the United States and we have 44 interceptor missiles, you okay, see the point. So say if Russia – does Russia have MIRVs too? Russia has MIRVs. So 1,000 missiles really is like 3,000. Those are actually warheads. And when oh, I say oh, the okay, numbers yes. are dizzying, right. the numbers are dizzying, right? They are. And thank you to Hans Christensen who, and his colleagues at the Nuclear Notebook, Matt Korda, and others who keep track of this because they do the best they can to – you know, based on who reports what to keep track of what MIRV missiles are where. And there are all these treaties that say you can't have this and you have to have that. And these numbers really are dizzying. But what I try in the book to just delineate the basic facts of what they are and how they exist. But, right. you know, so if you have a MIRV warhead, that counts as, you know, if, if the MIRV has four warheads in its nose cone, that counts as four nuclear weapons of the 1700. But still... It only takes one of those that's on the cover of my book um, to take out a city. And also, as I write in the book, the anarchy and the mayhem that is almost guaranteed to follow. And, I, and this comes straight out of the mouth of, you know, former Secretary of Defense Bill Perry uh, telling me that there's just absolutely no way that civil society can hold, even with one nuclear missile, right? right. And you have Craig Fugate, director of former director of FEMA, saying to me, you know, he was taking me through, FEMA's the one that's in charge of these super secret, top secret classified plans of what will happen after a nuclear war. And he's very honest. He's like, you know, we're an agency who plans for asteroids, okay? But he said, after a nuclear war, there's, it's just a matter of self-survive. That's an actual quote from him. You know, hope that you have Pedialyte stocked. So the idea that nuclear war is unthinkable, I believe, is a dangerous concept. Well, I think people need to think about nuclear war to understand this is madness. What's the craziest shit DARPA has done? Like the oh my absolutely God. most mind-bending <clears throat> thing that they've created. I think the biohybrids because when I – and when I say that thing they have done, right? So let's – for anyone who isn't familiar with DARPA, right? It's the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, a mouthful. They added the D um, They added later, the right? D mm -hmm. for defense. But it is the most powerful, most secretive, most productive military agency in the world. 
And I kind of believe that before I wrote the book, most people had not heard of DARPA. I mean, I think, you know, or at least when I was doing press for it, it was like shocking. I think you're right about that. So that's fascinating. And part of that has to do with DARPA likes the public perception of, you know, that they like do all these things for the good of humanity. And actually, we know from the declassified documents again, or actually this was not, not declassified. This was the statement by the first SECDEF at the time um, – the, the SECDEF at the time that the DARPA was created, um, Neil McElroy, an advertising executive who became a secretary of defense, um, <laughs> he said – he went to Congress to get the funding and he said this agency is going to create the vast weapon systems of the future. That is what DARPA does. They are always 20 years ahead of anything that you or I know. So any technology that is like – what the hell was that that I just saw and you're not supposed to have seen? That's DARPA. Right? They were doing Neuralink in the 90s, right? They were doing – they are always doing things 20 years before yeah. you know about them because mm -hmm. they do what is called blue sky technology. Blue sky right? research and technology, yes. yes. And they have to be ahead of the curve. They have That's to be, amazing. right? Is that – is DARPA the only – I mean when it comes to this kind of stuff like innovating – weapons for defense and national security. That's probably the only thing, the only apparatus that exists that's doing unlimited blue sky sort of research and development, right? Because I mean, they that have unlimited we, money. That we know of, but like, I mean, nothing surprises me anymore. And so when you find out there's like some agency you've never heard of, it's like, oh, of course, right? Like look at NRO, the National Reconnaissance Organization, right? National Reconnaissance Office, okay? NRO was created in 1961. No one knew it existed until 1993 when it was declassified. So they were the, involved in the first technology, the first satellite technology. So when I interviewed uh, Dr. Bud Whelan, who was the first, science, the first director of science and technology at CIA, he, was, he identified himself as the mayor of Area 51 because he worked out there. And he built the first satellite called Corona. This is like back in the old days when it literally took wet film images, dropped the wet film, and the Lockheed pilots would retrieve the film as it floated – the canister of film floated down from space with a parachute attached to it. I'm not kidding, right? So this is NRO. They're in charge of everything above, right? Right. And it was so classified, no one knew it existed for more than 30 years. Is it true that NRO officers or people in the NRO have to be cleared through CIA, NASA, and something else? That I don't know. Okay. But I do know they have their own classifications. Air Force, that's what things. it was. Yeah. I mean, they have they, – they all kind of work with one another, for one another, okay. you know. Um I mean, one of the guys I interview in nuclear war, Richard Garwin, who designed the thermonuclear bomb, drew the plans for Edward Teller, right? When Edward Teller couldn't figure out how to actually make the bomb explode, mm -hmm. Richard Garwin drew the design that allowed it to, right? He's 93. He's been – he's a major source for me in nuclear war in my book, right? He was one of the founders of NRO. So they all work part and parcel. Mm -hmm. But the point of this when you say – you know, is DARPA doing the most advanced technology? Maybe. But maybe there's another organization like NRO. I mean, right. people forget there are 17, at least 17 intelligence agencies. It's not just CIA. 17? So, 17. I mean, Google them, look them up, right? That's why there's now a director of national intelligence. So right, there right, are, right, right. you know, there are – and I think that to stay ahead of the enemy – you know, air quotes or not air quotes, to stay ahead, the federal government is always playing not just chess, but like, you know, move the magic balls, right? And what's under what hat. And so things need to be hidden so that secrets can be kept. When the F-117 was retired, I went to the um, ceremony with Ed Lovick, the grandfather of stealth technology, right? And it was amazing. It was up there at Lockheed at Skunk Works, okay? <laughs> and they made this announcement that was that – was, I just remember this one line, and I am paraphrasing, but they said, like, we created the F-117. It was like a 20-year project, you know, DARPA. Um, and for 20 years, I think there were 10,000 people cleared on the program. This is what the guy was saying that was giving this speech. And he said, and no one leaked it. 
And then he said, oh, correction. It was actually 10,000 people cleared plus Tom Clancy. What? <laughs> oh <my laughs> revealing, God. revealing that, you know, Tom Clancy had the in with the Lockheed guys. And that's where he got a lot of his, his secrets. Interesting. Yeah. One of the most interesting things I thought about the DARPA book also was that they were inviting science fiction writers mm. to meet with them. Like, I think one of them was the writer for Terminator. No, no, no. That was me going to the Pentagon. Oh, that was A reporting was trip, right? Oh, okay. But they did – but yes, yes, to your point, they did okay. after 9-11. The government – You know, remember that statement, you're too young, but after 9-11, there was a statement that was kind of an echo throughout – you know, it was in the zeitgeist that 9-11 was a failure of imagination, right? That no one could foresee – that terrorists could hijack airplanes and fly them into buildings, except for Tom Clancy. Um, and so that led DARPA to create, to hire science fiction writers. This is like an anecdotal project for DARPA. I mean, it's like a nothing burger. But it was really interesting to me mm -hmm. because they hired science fiction writers, a couple of whom I interviewed, to kind of sit around a round table and come up with the craziest ideas they could you know, of terrorist attacks and of surprise wow. attacks to then try to game out how they could defend against them, which is not a bad idea. On that, repo on that reporting trip, when I went to the Pentagon, I brought with me Chris Carter, as I was saying, we were working on Area 51 as a television show at the time, and also Gail Ann Hurd, who co-wrote The Terminator with her then husband, James Cameron, but who was also the producer on The Walking Dead, right? And when we went into the Pentagon, it was wild because – and again, this goes back to that idea that people are just humans with, you know – I mean, of course they're humans. But what I mean is we're all just like people with like, you know, spouses at home and animals and pets and kids and things because bringing those two to the Pentagon was like bringing Brad Pitt to a Girl Scout party, right? I mean – you know, it was no longer Annie put your pen away, which it usually is. Like, no one lets me take notes at the Pentagon because then they can't go be on the record, right? It's just background. Oh, right. And it was – and, you know, we had our cell phones out. We were taking, cam you know, pictures. The generals were like, come in here. Hide the classified stuff. I write about this in the book because it was so astonishing. They – and Chris Carter had created the character of the smoking man for the X-Files, mm. which is the quintessential – boogeyman, you know, the government boogeyman, right, who's always smoking and is up to no good, right? The He's sort of like the embodiment of conspiracy. And the generals loved that. And then Gail, having co-written The Terminator with Skynet, the generals loved that. And I found that both comforting and terrifying. And so did Chris and Gail. Right. Um, but, but the interesting part about, you know, we're all just sort of people at the end of the day was like at a couple points during this, this traveling around, you know, going through the Pentagon and whatnot, even though when you went into the bathroom, your minder had to follow you in there, right? That's how it works there mm. in the E-ring, mm. um, which is where the Joint Chiefs are. But at one point, someone was like, wait a minute, Chris Carter, just a second. And he's like, ding, you know, dials his wife. Honey, you're not going to believe this. Chris Carter's here. You can ask that question about episode eight, season 12, you know, and literally put him on the phone with the wife to answer the question. And it was like really interesting that everybody at the end of the day has real people problems and real people curiosity and real people questions most of them right maybe that's a good thing maybe that's what keeps us all from you know launching nuclear war not yeah. us launching nuclear war but them launching nuclear war. when i wrote operation paperclip about the nazi scientists who came to america after the war um my editor really taught me i had a position that i that was the closest i was coming to an opinion right my editor wise that he is suggested that I thread in some more of the concept of, you know, um, that many people believed if these Nazis didn't come to America, we'd all be speaking Russian, okay? So that that was necessary to win the Cold War. And I did that. And when the book came out, I mean, that was what, 2013, so you could actually, a journalist could still appear on CNN and Fox News 
back-to-back nights. I mean, that would never happen now, which right. is tragic, you know, in my opinion. But you could. You could be on both because I was just telling – you know, I just had an interesting story that lots of people were really interested in. And when I would be in the more conservative environments, they would – People would say, oh, my God, Annie Jacobson, thank God you wrote this book, Operation Paperclip. You showed us that if we didn't hire these guys, we'd all be speaking Russian. And then I would go over to the more liberal organizations, the news organizations, and they would say, oh, my God, Annie Jacobson, you wrote this book, Operation Paperclip. And, man, did you show us that hiring those Nazis was the worst, most odious, undemocratic thing we ever did. I mean, thank you so much for writing this book. They're both wrong. What do you think? I don't know. I think, I think, I think, well, they're, they're both right and they're both wrong, right? I think, I think that we had, it was either get those scientists or let the Russians get the mm. scientists. Like it's, it's, it's the game theory thing, right? It's right. the it's the um, the prisoners dilemma. The prisoners dilemma. The same thing with nuclear war. Like let's just say let's prosecute them all, send them off to prison, execute them, and let's hope that the Russians do the same exact thing. Or do we take all their science? I mean, it's mm-hmm. what's fascinating. Like one of the things that blew my mind about Operation Paperclip was that these people, like Warner von Braun. Von, is it Von Braun? You call him Von Braun. I mean, there's so many different pronunciations. I just try to stick to one pronunciation. Okay. But I am, I'm of the – I remember the, we had a president who said Pakistan and we had a secretary of state who said Pakistan. Oh, okay. So, right? You right. can say whatever. It's just transliteration. So, so after Hitler enacted that scorched earth mm-hmm. policy where he – what happened? They destroyed all the infrastructure in Germany, all the dams, all the bridges, everything, kind of like what they did in Rome. Mm-hmm. Um, von Braun and some other high-ranking Nazi scientists were basically like sitting in a mansion eating caviar because they knew that they mm. the, the Russians or the Americans needed them badly and they had a future with the U.S. Yeah. Army or with the Russians. Uh, Absolutely. And what was so interesting reporting that book was looking at documents in the National Archives, right? Looking at the files. So once they became part of the American national security apparatus, they had files on them. them. But then they – and they – their past, like sort of what they were doing in World War II was all done from interviews, right? So you have to take – into consideration that these were Nazis saying what they did, you know, under interrogation as opposed to seen through a different lens. Mm. I went to Germany and looked at the Bundes archives, and they had a lot of different kind of records that were fascinating. I mean, I had a German translator with me. And so I was able to report, I think, more of the story than had existed on the record, although I, you know, there's some incredible journalists that came before me that were working in different veins of the individual scientists and things, and I definitely stand on their shoulders, but definitely was able to get some original reporting on the record, including a lot of this sort of the capture moment, right? And 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 right before the war ended that you're talking about where these Nazis knew that the war was going to end not in their favor. And they wanted to work for the Americans. They knew they were they knew they were valuable and they did not want to go work for the Russians because they hated one another, the Russians and the Germans hated one another. And in fact, we know from the declassified documents that the uh, Germans, the Nazi scientists who did wind up in Russia were treated like garbage. Oh, really? Yeah. They had a they had a program. There, there's a whole CIA file on this I found at the National Archives <laughs> where the CIA was like, what are they, you know, what do they have, who do they have and what are they doing? And so we were constantly trying to get intel. And if this is, of course, all pre-U2, so it all kind of threads together. This is, you know, we, could, we didn't know anything. We didn't know what was going on in the aftermath of the war in Russia in those first few years. And so the CIA was hunting for information and the best information they could get was 
a couple years after um, the war ended, the the Russians kind of got all they could or all they thought they could from the German rocket scientists and then just sent them home. And we called the program, the CIA called the program Operation Dragon Return. That's what it was called. And we had CIA officers, um, you know, interviewing these – the Germans as they were being brought back to try to say, like, what did you tell the Russians? And it was interesting because the Russian rocket pro program was actually superior – to the American program in the early 50s. And, of course, they got really? Sputnik. And absolutely. they they Launching oh, yeah, Sputnik, Sputnik required, yeah. essentially, a ballistic missile. And so there's a really complex argument that, wait a minute, maybe those Nazi scientists weren't so great because the Russians, who were working from almost nothing, given what, you know, their country was destroyed. Mm. And yet they were able to build up their rocket program. So there's an argument that if American rocket scientists had been moved to the fore, you know, they would have been just as excellent as the Von Browns. Mm. But still, you know, having, inter having interviewed two of the men on the moon, two astronauts, Apollo astronauts, as I have, Ed Mitchell and... Uh, and Buzz Aldrin, mm -hmm. both who in our discussions, in our interviews, are so enamored with the German scientists, they can simply not think of them as former Nazis. Really? I mean, <clears throat> so, you know, this is... What does it mean a, to be a Nazi? That's a good question. That was in your book. Well, what do you think it means to be a Nazi? I don't know. I'm not qualified to answer. I think, you know, I found it interesting the story of, I think her name is Hannah Arendt, yeah. where she talks about she had a lover. She was Jewish, and she fell in love with a Nazi. And she had a, th basically what she talked about, she, breaking down good and evil. Like it's not, mm -hmm. she was saying that there's so much nuance. Like the guy that she was in love with was uh, the guy who was like in charge of the transportation with the trains or whatever. And she was like, this guy has never had a coherent th th mm. thought go through his mind. He's not a thinker, right? You, you say that how do evil mm. people sleep at night? Mm. Well, they sleep great because they don't have a conscience. And mm. this guy was just sort of following rules, right? You just sort of have people who aren't thinkers that just follow the rules and get through the day. And that was what she was saying about the guy she fell in love with. Like, this guy is not inherently evil. Like, he's mm -hmm. not a, a killer. He's not a Hitler. But he was born in a certain – in the wrong place at the wrong time, and he was following the rules. That was her argument. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, I didn't interview any Nazis. Right. So I only interviewed the children of Nazis. Right. And right. so my perspective comes from, like, the reverse engineering of the crime, right, the massive genocide. And so – when one looks at history like that, your lens is, you know, is focused on evil, right? So I don't – I can't yeah. think of it any other way. Right. And also I am someone who does believe in forgiveness, right? So that's a whole other complex situation and I have interviewed many people who have had a very guilty conscience and I have – I have – born witness to that right and it's a very it's a very human um situation you know it's just it's profound okay um what i found shocking was reading and studying all these nazis through their files through their interrogations and then also looking at those who kind of became heroes in America, right? And and sort of had buildings named after them and became part of the American, you know, way of life. Never once did any single one of them ever, ever, anywhere, ever in any document, be it their per private files or their public, you know, um, interviews, did they ever express remorse? Ever. 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 And that says something to me. What do you think that is? Denial. 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 Right. Can you explain this Otto Ambrose character? Mm. I mean... And didn't you interview his family? I did. I did. Um, 
Ambrose, to me, was pure evil, right? I mean, he worked for IG Farben, who was the chemical company who, you know, made Zyklon B and other, all kinds of other, um, you know, chemicals. And Ambrose was part of the chemical weapons scientists that were of great interest to the United States. But more than anything that was shocking to me was that I found in the National Archives the receipt, and this had never been reported before, of a one million Reichsmarks bonus that Adolf Hitler gave to Otto Ambrose to thank him for his work. One million Reichsmarks. That's how important he was to Adolf Hitler himself. And Ambrose was tried and convicted at Nuremberg of mass murder and slavery because he was in charge of the chemical element of the chemical factory. The, there was a rubber plant at Auschwitz called Buna. And most people don't even know about this. I didn't know about this before I reported Paperclip. But Buna was where the young men, who the young Jewish you know, um, concentration camp prisoners who, okay, you'd get off the trains, go that way to be gassed. Oh, you're a young man that's 18 years old and you look healthy. Let's work you to death over at Buna, building rubber for the Reich. Because they needed, you know, tanks and, you know, the, the tanks needed treads. Didn't they develop synthetic rubber? Yes. Weren't they the first ones that to come Ambrose. up there? That's that why was Ambrose. That got, was Ambrose. That's why they got the million in his team, wow. yes. And he was in charge of the plant there. And then on the flip side of that, I interviewed Gerhard Marshawski, who was an actual Buna survivor, right? So he was 18 years old. And he was picked coming off the train and, you know... It's like when, I mean, he was in his 90s when I interviewed him, and he described to me how when he was leaving quickly, like, oh, you know, of course people didn't know they were getting on a train to go to Auschwitz. Auschwitz, they just knew they had to leave quickly from where their home. And he put on his best boots, like his sturdiest boots, and those boots saved his life because he could work and walk through the frozen, you know, soil, to th- this Buna factory that was just so, you know, it was a death camp. It was mm. a work to death camp as opposed to right. gas you to death camp. Right. And auto the, the records that I found in Germany that describe Ambrose, you know, a few days before the Russians liberated um, Auschwitz, knowing the Russians were near, and Otto Ambrose like rapidly gathering up all his papers so that he wouldn't be, you know, caught for the criminal, the war criminal that he was. Um, And then leaving on a fancy train. Um, And, you know, the fact that we were interested in in him and hired him is just, it just, it's, it's horrifying in every level. And, I mean, remember, he was convicted at Nuremberg, and he was in Landsberg prison, and then a kind of deal was made um, to let the prisoners out because, you know, there was a new war. The, this is now we're in the late 50s or the mid 50s, and it's time to get, you know, get over the what happened in Germany. And that's one of the conditions for the Germans to be our partners um, the West Germans, was to release all the prisoners from Landsberg. And that's why Ambrose, Otto Ambrose, was released. And then he, you know, it's very mysterious in what capacity he worked for us. But he did work for us because he has a paperclip file. But, and there are, you know, there's entry and exit visas and nothing else, right? It's just all been obfuscated, right? The story is waiting to be told. More of it. I told what I could in paperclip, you know. Um, I mean, they even gave him his villa back. They gave him his Swiss 
villa. Is back. that where his family lives now? Yes, and it's complicated because I reached the son, uh-huh. and um, who got all the money, you know, and like oh it God, was it, living in a house that was paid for by Hitler. <laughs> I mean, it was a very contentious conversation, yeah. and it was like, "Do not call me anymore." And I, you know, I even pursued that, and I remember being told by one of my attorneys, like Annie, they have different laws in Germany for stalking. Like you can, you know, because a reporter can kind of really, you know, you can become a bit like a pit bull with a bone, mm. especially in a situation like that, you know. You really wanted to talk to him. I really wanted to know. Did you consider just showing up at his house? That's what I was going to do, and I was just advised against it. Ser- like not not advised, like told, like right. don't do that. Bad you know? idea. <sighs> Good lord. Who who else yeah. did you talk to there when you went there? Well. Dr. Blum. So mm. if you if you Google Kurt Blum, yeah, or Blum, you, you can how find a pronounced. photo of him and yeah. Kennedy and Johnson. You should find that, Steve. No, no, no. That that's Debus. That's oh, Kurt, that's Debus. That's Kurt okay. Debus. That's okay. okay. He was. I mean, he. You know, Blum was <clears throat> the Reichsgesundheitsführer. That was his German title, and that means the Deputy Surgeon General okay. of the Third Reich. Okay, and he was he was such. In such close proximity to Hitler, he wore the Golden Party badge. It's this little pin that meant he had favor with the Fuhrer, right? And he planned, oh, God, the documents I found in the Bundes archive, they were just murderous, mm-hmm. you know. Um, Dr. Kurt Blum is his name. There he is up there on the left, right? Top left. Yeah. And... Um, he has that dueling scar. Yeah, they all know. had those dueling scars. But he, he, I found these documents where he talks about giving Sonderbehandling, that's the German term, to, you know, like, I think it was 10,000 or maybe it was 18,000 tubercular poles, like Polish people with tuberculosis. And Sonderbehandling means special treatment. And that's the way that a reporter unwinds, like, oh, that's a euphemism for death. Because he's writing these documents I found. He's writing back and forth to Himmler. You know, we should just give them Sunderby handling, special treatment. And Himmler saying, yes, but the parents might want, or the family members might wonder. You know, so you can, they're deciding to kill masses of people. And when I went to to speak with Kurt Blum's son, who had never done an interview until we did an interview, who is just a remarkable human being, like amazing, you know, just... What was he like? Oh, my God. I mean, he had been a doctor, and he looked. he's like, for as evil as his father looks, he looks kind and gentle and is, right? And he writes books, and he'd given up his medical, his traditional medical career to treat people with Bach flowers, What's a right? Bach flower? Like Bach is like it's like a Bach flower. It's like it's like almost like aromatherapy. Oh, okay. Right. So it's like holistic medicine, and it's this incredible human irony that the father, because Kurt Blum's primary job and why he was interesting to the Defense Department, the War Department, was that he was working on a bubonic plague bomb for Hitler. Okay. Literally. I mean, the documents are all there. He was developing a plague bomb for Adolf Hitler. Jesus Christ. He was in charge of the biological warfare program. And that he was trying to kill people, you know, that way, and his son is trying to cure people for with flowers, is this remarkable irony. Mm. And it, it's just endlessly interesting. And the, you know... America being a country where, like, everyone seems to have, like, father issues, right? Mm -hmm. And then you go and you, I mean, just to have met the young Dr. Blum and you kind of put yourself in his moccasins and you imagine, I mean, he had no contact with his father. Never met him? No, no, he met him and all of that, but, like, after the war, I mean, you know. Oh, he just abandoned him after the war. Yeah, they just went, you know, um, Kurt Blum's wife, Bettina Blum, was... Um, Germany's, let me get this right, she was Germany's most famous novelist. Like, I think it was even romance novels, like in the 30s, right? 
They were this dashing couple, mm-hmm. you know. And it was interesting because he was he was a he was kind of like an epic figure in German medicine before, you know, the Reich took before over. Hitler. And he 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 transformed, you know. Billy Waugh, to jump over to Surprise Kill Vanish, CIA paramilitary, mm-hmm. if I may, right? Like, Billy was such an extraordinary person. You know, he started out as a source and he became a friend. And he only shared with me what he could, right? I mean, but it was clear that there was so much more going on. One of the last phone calls I had, conversations I had with him, I was being asked to speak out in... Palm Springs. I live in LA. And so there there was a car service that drove me out. And I was like in the car. I was like, I'm calling Billy. Right. And that was in December. That was in November. And he died in April. Right. So it was very close to his end. Right. And he told me the cra- I told him I was writing the book on nuclear war. And he told me the craziest stories. Like, yeah. And he told me about this mission that he was in in Alaska for one of the nuclear tests that went off there. And I was like, Billy, what? Like, you never told me about this. I don't know about this. And, you know, he would chuckle. And it was like, you know, one one millionth of what I did, right? He was an operator for the CIA f- starting when Eisenhower was in office. Right. White Star, you know. That was the program before the Vietnam War in Laos, right? That was mm-hmm. a long, long time ago. And he worked for the agency almost straight through to the end, right? We know he went to Gaddafi. He, he went to Libya right right before Gaddafi was killed. What was that in 2011? I mean, he was in his 80s, you know? Um, I mean, and who knows? He may have still been operating when when we were working together. When we, you know, he and I traveled to Hanoi. We traveled to Havana. Um, I always got the sense of that he was working, you know? There was always something going on because he was an incredible asset for the agency. I mean, he could... He Did could, you just feel untouchable traveling with him into these most the most dangerous parts of the world? I mean, okay, I'll tell you an interesting story. So right before we left, we, he came to my house. I live in Los Angeles. And, um, and, actually, and my husband's Norwegian, and my husband had a friend. Norwegian's my husband's mother tongue, and he had a friend, Per Ostein, visiting from Norway a business on a business trip. So we were all sitting in the garden, right, for this. And Billy was telling stories. We were about to go to Hanoi. And he also insisted on having $10,000 in cash in his back pocket. Okay, and I say, I mean, it sounds so apocryphal. It's actually true, and there are two witnesses, right? So he has this. I mean, it's he's got hundred dollar bills folded up, and he's eighty seven and a half years old. And we're about to go to Hanoi, and we're ha- we're sitting there in, in my garden, you know, um, eating dinner, and Billy's got this wad of cash, and I say to him, you know, Billy, um, that might not be a great idea to have that in a third world country, like $10,000 hanging out of your pocket like that, right? And like, Mm -hmm. I mean, it was like, what a dumb thing to say, okay? Like (laughs) really and truly, like this is Billy Waugh, you know what I mean? Like he's operated around the whole world. He's got like, you know, bullet frags in his, I mean. He was taking jogs running from Bin Laden's dogs. (laughs) I mean, everyone's tried to kill him. He was invincible. And here I am telling him not to have this money. But on the other hand, like it's kind of, true like why would he's 87 you know and he before I could finish the sentence he has picked up a fork and thrust it into the wooden coffee the wooden picnic table and said anyone tries to you know, and then he says like ten swears, you know, with me. Mm-hmm. That's what's going to happen to them. And this fork, and we're all just looking at it. And this fork is just like, ding, you know, in the table, right? <laughs> Did he fa- pay to get your table fixed? No, <laughs> it didn't matter. It's just a, it's just a wooden picnic table, right? <laughs> but the point is like, Billy, and like, why did he? Ha- I still think about that. Like, Did that why? scare you? No, Billy. He comes off in your book as like this just old school kind of guy who is like this protective, 
like a knight in shining armor mm. or you could go anywhere and you mm. would just be like, you would feel invincible with him. Mm. You know, he's the knuckle dragger mm. assassin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But were there any moments where like that, like, like that fork yeah. in the table that okay. like gave you pause, be like, Oh my God, this is, this guy mm -hmm. is, he is who I think he is. He's not just this, you know, the fork in the table was the only time that Billy broke the ven veneer of just being so, so calm and you know like that was an attack right and that was because I kind of insulted him or at least that was his perception of that right but um I liked your definite I liked hearing John Kiriakou talk about Billy it was amazing and I loved also that he said that Billy swore all the time because the truth of the matter is this is the one quid pro quo I had with Billy right Billy swore I mean it was so fun to be around him yeah. because like everybody has the little kid in them that like you know your mother tells you you're not supposed to swear constantly and Billy just every other word that came out of his mouth was a swear but he wanted he we made an agreement that in the book I wouldn't use the F word, every other word, because it was disruptive. You right. know what I mean? Right. And so, I mean, there is, I, but I thought that was very interesting because it, you know, the knight in shining armor part of it was diffused by the fact that Billy had this vocabulary that was just, <laughs> you know, I have videos of him um, during, during, during uh, the pandemic, we did a lot of Zooms to kind of stay oh, in really? touch. Yeah, and, I, and maybe I'll put them up one day because they're just apps. I mean, oh, Billy yeah, would sit in his office and shoot the shit with me, you know. And he would just tell old stories again and again and again. And they were just, um, you know, it was really awesome. It was like great getting that stuff down on the record out of his mouth, right? Because he was really a one of a kind, you know. He was when he I was at his funeral here in Tampa. Um, yeah. At 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 and the I was talking to Rick. I he told yeah. me you were coming to town. Like I gotta get her on the yeah. podcast. I gotta get her yeah. down here. Rick's like, yeah. you want me to kidnap her? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm like, I don't know. Those guys are funny. I mean, I once speaking of kidnapping, I once had a, a friend who got stuck in Morocco during the pandemic. Right? Like, remember when the in that March 15th or whatever that was when Trump closed the borders and like you could barely get back into the United States. Oh yeah, yeah. And I had a friend my age who was stuck in Morocco, oh, and no. I and she, and she was seriously worried. And I called up Rick and like some other guys, and they were like, "Oh yeah, we'll go get her." You know, no way. it's going to be expensive, and she's going to have to come out by boat. But it was like they gave me a whole plan about how That's they could amazing. go get her, and it was like, "Wow, right?" They were not kidding around. Wow, yeah. now, a lot of Billy's operations were it, like it sounded like, especially. During the first few operations, I think his first one was to Libya. Is that right? Well, um, that was after the Vietnam War. After, after yeah, the Vietnam uh, yeah, War, yeah. obviously after the Vietnam yeah. War, he started to go and work. For, he worked for the post office, mm -hmm. and then it's like when he got hired on these covert op operations, mm -hmm. it seemed like there wasn't much communication. Like he wasn't sure yeah. who he was working for. Always, I mean, he was a singleton, right? So that meant he operated alone for the most part. And that is a remarkable job, right? Mm -hmm. And when, when I interviewed Kofor Black, who is a very top yeah. CIA person mm -hmm. during the whole war on terror and was Billy's boss, you know, and, and like I'm paraphrasing here, but he's, he said something like, again, you know, these, these guys always saying like, oh, Annie, like you really think you know anything, right? And he basically said like – Huh, you know, you think you got all this stuff from Billy, but the truth of the matter is most of his career was spent getting verbal messages from guys like me with nothing written down. Wow. And that is just stunning to think about, that there's an element of the national security apparatus that functions like that, right? Mm -hmm. So what it really is is president to Kofor Black to Billy Waugh. And Billy wow, Waugh, God. right? And does that still go on? I don't know, right? But what I do know is being able to get Billy Waugh's story on the record was like a real privilege for somebody like me because it's – okay, so if it's one one-thousandth of the story, it's still an incredible through line of seeing one man – 
operate through all these wars, right? And of course, it culminates in in the end of the book. That book leads me to nuclear war, mm-hmm. which is, you know, do you remember the scene I I recreate when we're in Jop's Garden in Hanoi? Yes, right? I do. So yes. so to set the stage for that, Billy um, was assigned to kill the leader of the North Vietnamese Army, General Jop. Right. And General Jop in many ways was like more – I don't want to say more powerful than Ho Chi Minh, um, but was like, you know, just as important, right? Mm-hmm. He led the army and everybody followed him. Right. And the American government wanted him dead like nobody's business. Mm-hmm. There was a perception that the Vietnam War would end if Jop was dead, right? Mm-hmm. And so Billy was assigned to kill him on this mission called Oscar 8, which I write about in Surprise, Kill, Vanish, and which Billy wrote about in his book. And is just a remarkable, shocking mission, okay? And so when we go back to Hanoi, Billy and I travel there, and we are set to meet with General Jop's son. Jop had died just a few years before, at like the age of over 100. And... Um, his son, Dien Bien, named after the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, the house, this gorgeous house, is not far from like the mausoleum where Ho Chi Minh lies in rest. And it's this magnificent house with a huge garden. And like basically, it's a museum of Jop, right? There's medals, and I mean, just, and, and, and also an er- Jop's um, ashes are there and like kind of there's like a Buddhist little temple that we went into. I mean, it was just wild, right? But we're sitting in the garden and Dian Bien brought to the picnic, no pun intended, um, the man assigned to kill Billy Wall, right? General Zhang, right? So so it was just like two arch enemies in meeting their 90s. in their 90s. <laughs> Me, Billy wasn't quite yet in his okay. 90s, but, but, the, but the, the colonel was. And they were like – and it was just wild to be discussing the war, to listen. I mean they were discussing the war. I was listening. And then this subject comes up because as I write in the book, Billy was part of the green light. And we talked about this earlier, the Area 51 dr- bomb dropping when they jumped the nuclear weapon. That was a test to see if such a team like that, a green light team, would ever use that weapon in war. Would ever use a tactical nuke, that thing that you and I have been saying must never happen, right? right. <laughs> so in the 60s, this was a real thought. And the Defense Department looked long and hard about, wait a minute, because the Ho Chi Minh Trail was this engineering masterpiece, this pathway through the jungle through which all these weapons were being run up and down and was fueling the, the NVA, the North Vietnamese Army. And so the and the government had tried every which way to shut this trail down, and they couldn't. And a, a kind of one idea that got run by the Jason scientists, I write about this in the Pentagon's brain, and then again in Surprise, Kill, Vanish from a different point of view. The idea was, well, we could drop it or place a tactical nuclear weapon on the trail, blow it up, and then it'll cut off, you know, it's like Mm -hmm. cutting the artery. And so in this, you know, there we are in Hanoi in 20, what was it, 2016, uh, Billy Waugh and the arch enemy, Colonel Zhang, talking to each other about what it was like to try and kill each other and all their friends are dead and they're alive. And the subject comes up of this tactical nuclear weapon. And Billy says, we should have used it. And Zhang and Dien Bien are like, excuse me? I mean, I write this out in the book. They're like, what? The Americans would never have done that. That's a ridiculous concept. And Billy explains to them that it was actually thought through and it was decided against. And Billy took the position that we should have used the tactical nuke. And... I was shocked. And they he were shocked. Still thought he thought like going back, I would have used it if it was my choice, or was he kind of? Here's what he said, and I'm paraphrasing. It's actually sourced in the book of what he really said from the from right. the tape recorder. But he said something to the effect of, "58 thousand of my, you know, friends and countrymen died, and a million of your friends and countrymen died. One tactical nuclear weapon would have ended the war, and that was just like." 
it was just this mind-boggling concept. I mean, I completely disagree with it. Obviously, you see for reasons why in nuclear war scenario. But that was Billy's position. And so, you know, for as much – like everything about Billy Waugh to me is is just – he was a man – he was one of a kind, you know. Yeah. As I said as, at his memorial service, he rode for the brand, right? But I fundamentally disagreed with him on the tactical nuclear weapon. Mm. And, you know, we had many arousing conversations about that because, um, you know, he, I mean, and I think that that from the – and again, the, the you know, the, that she who has never been in war, right? My perspective on that would be like, wow, there are – the government needs to have different kinds of people. You don't want Billy Waugh in charge of the, <laughs> right. your nuclear arsenal, right? And we laugh, but it's not funny. 